Thank, thank you so much. So, so wonderful to see everyone again. And um, yes, uh, just, and just, just a quick update. Noah is doing very well, still walking in faith. And, uh, and I, I think you may have also had an opportunity to hear the preaching of Wayne Earl. Um, and uh, he also went through the program about the same time as Noah. And uh, I get to, I get the, the privilege of working with Wayne, but uh, an even greater privilege about a month ago, um, I, I was able to attend Wayne's ordination service. He's now a full, fully ordained uh, minister in the Southern Baptist Convention, and he leads a small church in Richmond. So, um, you know, still good, good things that God is doing through the Bay Area Rescue Mission. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a blessing to, to see all that uh, all he does and his care for the least of, the, of us. So um, today, um, I'll be teaching from John chapter 14. And um, I, someone had asked if I had any notes, but uh, no, I, I apologize for that, except that uh, I feel that uh, you're better off just with your Bible open. And I'll give you a kind of a heads up that you might wanna have a, a, a place, you, you, a finger in the Bible on cha John chapter 14, but also in 1 John, chapter four, I'll, I'll be referencing uh, quite a bit of scripture um, in this teaching. So um, there'll be some others, but uh, for the, those two primarily, if you, you know, you might want to be ready to flip back and forth. So let me, uh, let me read um, a passage here, starting in John 14, um, verse 11. And we're going to read through uh, verse 21. A uh, little context here, Jesus um, has just served uh, or had uh, the Last Supper with his disciples and basically had you know, given them a little bit of instruction and a little bit of foresight that uh, you know, where he was going, they wouldn't be able to come. Um, and it, it sparked quite a bit of, of, of discussion. And in fact, it was uh, you know, Philip who said, Jesus, just, just show us the Father and that's enough for us. And um, in response to this, let me, uh, um, you know, I'm going to jump in kind of mid-sentence where, where Jesus responded to him. And again, John 14, verse 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you will know him, for he lives with you and will be, with, will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by, by my father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Hear the word of the Lord. So, right in the midst of this, Jesus gives us some interesting insight. He, he tells us, if we love him, and let me stop right there and stop for a moment. Think of what the world, how the world might answer that question or how they might finish that phrase. If you love me, I was curious myself. I, I actually Googled it. I just typed in, if you love me and hit search. And it, it's interesting, the, uh, the responses that came back. And this was just on the search bar. It says, if you love me, let me go was one response. 
The next one was, if you love me, let me know. <laughs> there was another one is, if you love me, won't you say something? And then I thought the best one was like, if you love me, it'll all be okay. So interesting that Jesus starts out with, if you love me. So that is, that's the, the, the theme here, if we love Jesus. So let me, uh, let me pause for a second. And again, no, no, no presentation, but if, if for those of you who take notes, let me give you a, a quick, it's a kind of a three point outline, you know, so point number one, if you love me. And let me, let me stop, start with a quick definition of love. Um, in English, we have one word that covers at least three words of the Greek. The Greeks, I think, had a, a far more specific vocabulary in this term. So um, I know of at least three Greek words that all get translated to love in English. Um, one is eros. And in fact, uh, when you when you listen to popular culture or the songs on the radio, mostly what they're talking about is, oh, I, I just love this person, and I just I'm I'm so caught up in these feelings of love. That would be the Greek word eros. It's that that feeling of really kind of infatuation. Um, it has the the sense of attraction, especially between men and women. Um, that uh, you know, it just kind of gets our, our blood up and we get all excited and we get a little bit loopy in our head and you know um, you know that thing love is blind that is that's the eros effect another Greek term is is phileo which would be brotherly love um, the city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love and that's the word phila is uh, is the Greek term for that type of love the the love that you have between you know, a, a man and his brother, a brother and a sister within a family, um, or between very, very close friends. Um, so just really quickly, we're not talking about Eros or Phileo today. When Jesus says, if you love me, the Greek term is agapeo. And what that means is sacrificial love. And if you if you're at John 14, just look, read a little bit further ahead and go to John 15, verse 13. Again, this is all part of the same discussion that Jesus is having with his disciples. And at one point, Jesus says in John 15, 13, he says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So this agape love that Jesus is talking about is a sacrificial love. It's we our, our our feelings our our care for this other is so great that we're willing to disadvantage ourselves and offer that advantage to the other um we we sacrifice it costs us something to love with agape love um whereas with eros or phileo it's usually we're, we're receiving something instead we we get a good feeling from it we 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 have that bonding no agape love is sacrificial love it's it's a giving love another example of this is it's in john three sixteen, which i'm sure you all know very well it says for god loved the world his he agape the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life Again, so this is this is the love that we're talking about. It's, it's agape love. Um, it's a love that sacrifices. It's a love that gives. Uh, the next point. So Jesus says, if you love me. So let me ask, why? Why should we love? And here's where, again, if you, um, you might want to flip over to 1 John chapter 4. And the first reason that we should love is that God is love. That's his very nature. It tells us that uh, in 1 John 4, 7, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. 
So again, we should love because God himself is love. It's his very nature. It's his very character. And if we are in him and of him, then we too would love. Secondly, we would we love because he loved us. And, they, and now just a little bit further, 1 John 4, 11, we're told, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Um, just a quick thought on this. Whenever you see the word ought in scripture, I know for me, it ought sounds like a suggestion, but in the context of the Greek when scripture was written, the word ought means it's an obligation. It's like a debt. If you, if you took money from the bank, they don't think that may, they, they don't suggest that maybe when you feel like it, you pay them back. No, they demand that you pay them back. It's you, because you have an obligation, you have a debt to repay. So because of the love that God has given us, we have an obligation, a debt to repay. But interesting, let's go back to that verse. It says, we ought, because God loved us, we have an obligation to love one another. So again, we love because God loved us. And then finally, we love because he loved us first. And again, in the same passage, 1 John, in, in 1 John 4, 19, we're told that we love because he first loved us. A quick uh, interesting anecdote. So again, the, the, the first passage that we're reading out of the Gospel of John and 1 John, um, this is the, the disciple when he described himself as he was the disciple that Jesus loved. We're told that at the Last Supper that he was leaning up against Jesus. Um, obviously, he was very close to Jesus. Um, and he was also the one that uh, when, when Peter was told by Jesus that he would you know, follow in his footsteps in terms of uh, you know, the same type of death, um, it was kind of implied that, that John would not. And the truth is that we know by history that John lived to be a, an old man, whereas the other disciples, I believe, all died the death of a martyr. Not that John didn't suffer. We know he did. But he lived to be an old man, and he was the uh, and he 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 was the elder of the church in Ephesus. And non biblical history tells us that even as an old man, when he could barely walk, he would have younger men carry him up to the front of the congregation. And he was so weak from his age that he could barely talk. But what he could say, he would say, and he and he would always say, "Beloved, my little children, love each other, love one another." So um, he, he's well deserving of the, uh, he's known as the, as the disciple of love. So further um, again, so we, we, we love because God is love, because he loved us and he loved us first. But now Jesus said, if you love me, So the next point, why should we love Jesus? I know for most of you, it seems the answer is obvious, but I think it's important. It's good to look into scripture and, and realize that um, we are to love him because as we just read in John 14, in John 14 Jesus and the Father are one. Um, and where he said in 14.6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you've seen him. And this is where Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. 
or at least believe the evidence of the works themselves. So we see by Jesus's words, his own proclamation that he and the Father are one. But if we have any doubt remaining, Jesus, Jesus allowed for that doubt. I love how Jesus and, and God's word will, it doesn't presume upon our understanding or our, our weak faith. It allows for us to, to, to have questions, to wonder, and it, it puts the questions there and answers the questions before sometimes we even ask them. But Jesus said, you know, if you don't believe just my words, look at all the miracles that I've done. Look at the works that the Father has done in me. And we have that, we have the, the, the benefit of, of history where we can see that where Jesus fed multitudes, he healed lame people, he healed blind people. Um, he spoke with authority, not as the teachers of the law. All these things give testimony to who Jesus is. And then ultimately we have his very own word and the, and the testimony as well of his Holy, of this Holy Spirit, that Jesus and the Father are one. And so why should we love him? Well, because the, the, he and the Father are one and we are commanded to love. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, we have the first recorded version of, of what is known as the Shema. Shema is a Hebrew word, which effectively translates as listen. And it says, listen, Israel, or hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And again, this was Moses teaching and preparing the people of Israel um, for how they should live. But interestingly, Jesus pointed to the Shema multiple times in his earthly ministries. Um, we have three of the four Gospels recording this. Um, so in, in both Matthew and Mark and Luke, we see um, where Jesus is approached and is asked, um, uh, excuse me, one second, I need to plug in my computer. Yeah, Brother, and, Paul, uh, Brother Paul, sometimes, two times, you know, some, the connection broke off for about four seconds. Okay. So am I, are we okay now? Yeah, it sounds, yeah, it sounds okay. Cool okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I can't claim a mastery over technology. I'll just do my best. So, um, but uh, it, it was interesting in, in, in Dr. Dr. Sean May's teaching, he, he was talking about how the three of the four gospels talk about Jesus clearing the temple. Again, in three of the four gospels, but not in the gospel of John, we see where Jesus is asked the question of what is the greatest commandment out of the law? But here's an interesting point. If you look at that, and, and Jesus, in, in every case, he points back to the Shema, which is love the Lord your God. In other words, the Lord is God. He is one. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Um, but if you, if you look at the, the three gospel accounts, you'll see that in Matthew, he's being tested um, and he's being asked, what is the greatest commandment? And his answer is, it is this one. It's the Shema. You, you, are, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Mark, he's asked again that question. But in a different context, he's not being tested to try to trip him up. There's someone who's tr truly curious, and he, he, he knows, he sees that Jesus is a good teacher, and he has answered well. And he said, what is, what is the, what's the most important? And when Jesus answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbors yourself, the person who asked him said, wow, that's a really good answer. That's, that's right. And then he goes on to say, because it's better than burnt offerings and sacrifice. And then the final one is, 
he's asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer to that is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So again, back to the point, why should we love him? Why should we love Jesus? And the answer is because Jesus and the Father are one and the same. And we have this command to, to do so. And we are told it's the greatest command. We are told that it's better than a burnt sacrifice or offering. And in fact, let me let me give a, an, an, an illustration to that. Sometimes we think of how do I love God? Um, you know, we feel like we have to sacrifice, and yet we're told we love God not by loving, not, not by the things we give to him. He needs nothing from us, but he requires of us our love and our obedience, and that would be to love one another. And then ultimately, we're told in Luke 10, 27, that that is the way toward eternal life. It's love for God. So question then, how? How do we love God? And I've kind of just answered that. But as Jesus said, and this is my second point in the sermon, we will obey. He says, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey. So let me ask questions again on that one part. Why should we obey? And again, let me just point to God's word for why we should obey. First, it's the wise thing to do. Jesus speaking in Luke 6.46, you can turn there if you want. If not, I will, I will, I'll just read it here. Jesus is speaking to his disciples saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Again, a, a little bit of insight on, on Hebrew language. They didn't use words like very, really, you know, super. <laughs> but if you wanted to emphasize something, if you know, Lord meant master. If you repeat it, it it's emphasizes it, Lord, Lord means that you are very, very much the master. Or we see it in holy, right? We are told that God is, is holy, holy, holy. Three is the utmost in holiness. Lord, Lord means he is very much the, the, our master, not just a regular earthly supervisor or master, but he is Lord, Lord. And yet he asks, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'll show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep, laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like the man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. He built on the sand. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So obedience to Christ is simply a wise thing to do. It's going to set up the foundation of our lives so that when the troubles and difficulties in life come, we won't be shaken. Certainly we will experience the storm. Everybody experiences the storm. The question is, is the house going to collapse or is it going to stand? So the encouragement is we should obey because it's wise and our, our life, the house of our life will stand when those storms come. And again, we talked earlier about the teacher of the law coming and asking Jesus about what is the best or the, the, the most important commandment. And, and I just mentioned this, that when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself, the, the teacher of the law responded. And this is, um, this is in Mark chapter 12, verse 33. I'm sorry, starting at 32. 
he responds to Jesus. He says, well said, teacher. You're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. For to love God with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he'd answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So again, obedience is not just the wise thing, it's better, it's the better thing to do, especially what we are asked to do. And this is the third point. Jesus said, if you love me, point one, you will obey, point two. And our final point is what Jesus said, what I command. So this should beg the question, well, what did Jesus command? And it's interesting that uh, in the translations of scripture, um, I'm reading from a, a 1980s version of the NIV. And it says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. There are other versions that says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So again, um, the question is, which commandments? And I think here it's very important to look at the context in this passage. So let me give a, a really quick, broad outline. This is the upper, upper room discourse where Jesus and his disciples enjoyed the Last Supper. The same one that Jesus said, I've, I've longed to have this, this, this supper celebration with all of you, and I won't be tasting it again until, um, until I have it. When basically when when I return, um, and if you recall, he started that evening by stripping down and washing his disciples' feet, and he said, "You know, you don't really understand it, but you will." And then he talks about he's going to be betrayed, and then what I believe is the the culminating point of the supper is he says i'm going to give you a new commandment now understand that um i, I think I, I, I missed something he he talked about in the news he talked about the new covenant he said there's a new covenant in my blood now understand that the old covenant was given by moses and it was what defined israel as a nation it would be like somebody coming into the United States and saying, I'm gonna give you a new constitution. We're gonna completely rework this. But deeper than that, because Israel's covenant was between that people and with God. Um, so with the new covenant, Jesus is offering a new commandment and his commandment is this. And we're reading from John 13, 34. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And again, we are, we're talking about some of the discussion that followed that commandment, where Jesus again says, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. And then he keeps speaking. He talks about the vine and the branches um, in John 15. And I think it's, it's worth saying that both leading into Jesus's comment of, if you love me, you'll obey my commandment. And following that, when he's speaking about greater love in John 15, eight, he says, this is to my father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just, I have, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Quick comment, why is that a new commandment? Well, how is that different than the old commandments, right? I think the, the Shema gives us a little bit of a, a, of, of a hint there because Jesus said in the Shema, we are to love God 
And then he said, the second commandment is that is like it. We, we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Is that what Jesus commanded? No, I would argue Jesus doesn't command us to love each other the way we love ourselves. He really steps it up, right? We are told to love one another as Jesus loved. This agape love that we're talking about, the one that, that gives, the one that sacrifices. As he said um, earlier, or, or as we, we talked about earlier in John 15, he says, no greater love is this than that we lay down our lives for our friends. So the sacrificial love that Jesus is talking about is the type of love that we're commanded to ourselves. So in conclusion here, my question for all of us is how do we apply this? Seriously, <laughs> how in the world are we supposed to love like Jesus loved? Really, I mean, he's, he's the son of God. He is God incarnate, God in the flesh. And we're thinking, well, wait, Jesus, you know, I can't do it like Jesus did it, right? It's kind of an important doctrinal point here, folks, that realize when Jesus left heaven and incarnated, you know, we're told he emptied himself and he became a man. So in what power and what strength was Jesus able to love and obey the, he obeyed the father and seeks for us to obey him, right? He did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think he recognized that we were going to have this same struggle. And I think he recognized it because we're told that he, he is not a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, right? He has experienced everything that we've experienced. It's just that he was perfect. He just, he carried it out in perfect obedience. So first off, I think we start by acknowledging we cannot carry out his command on our own or in our own strength. And I think Jesus knew this because right after he said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. He follows that with, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he, loved, he lives with you and will be in you. So here's my word of encouragement. We, we have the command literally the impossible command, but we are given the ability to do the impossible because we have been given the spirit by Jesus himself. So if you're like me and you do some self-evaluation, <laughs> this is hard. I, I, I say, okay, Jesus, do I love the way that you love? Am I sacrificial in my love? Am I giving or Am I more inclined to love myself, to exalt myself before others? And more often than not, the answer is yes, I'm, I'm more inclined towards self. And so I take that to the Lord in prayer and in confession. And I hold to a promise that you'll find in Luke chapter 11, when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, um, let me turn there for a second. Um, he was teaching them, first off, what to pray, which was, was God's kingdom and glory and power. Um, and then he gives a parable of how to be persistent. And he talks about going to a neighbor at midnight and asking for bread. And, and the fact that the neighbor's not going to answer because it's midnight. But you just keep pounding on the door. And then if you keep pounding on the door, he's going to get up because it's better because of your, as, as it says in scripture, because of our impudence. In other words, our childlike insistence 
of get, of asking for what we want. And I love this because in Luke 11, 11, Jesus says, which of you fathers, if you have, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. But Lord, we, we know that it's easy to say that. And it's another thing to, to carry it out because you've just taught us that if we love you, we obey you. And what we are told, the commandment we are to obey is, is love for one another. So my prayer, Father, is that you would give us your love. You would flow your love through us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to see the ways that we can um, give and give sacrificially. Lord, make us aware of the needs of one another. Give us the heart of compassion that Jesus had. Give us the heart of obedience that Jesus had. And Lord, we, we know that this is not something that we have or that we can, we can muster up on our own. We know this comes only in the power of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you. We claim that promise, Lord Jesus, that you will send your spirit. And we know that you have. And we know that therefore we are able to do the impossible, which is to love as you loved Jesus. And we do so in the power of your Holy Spirit so that all the world will know that we are your disciples and that you will be glorified, Father. So we ask this in Jesus' name.